here to introduce our True Tales Live Zoom show on June 28th, 2022. Thanks to everyone for watching and listening, and especially those here in our live online audience. Hello, everyone. So our mission at True Tales Live is to provide a space for people to tell their first person experience stories. Stories that reflect our community's personal and cultural diversity help us to bridge differences and build understanding and respect for each other. We are so happy to be here with you. And we have some suggestions that we have learned over the past couple years that make Zoom work extra well. Here they are. Number one, if you are willing to keep your video on, that is awesome. And if you can have big physical reactions, in order to connect with the rest of the audience and especially the teller, that is really wonderful. Like, in fact, right now, let's cheer on Martha. Go, <laughs> Martha! Well done. Um, so you can you can keep that up and have some fun with that. You can also express reactions in the chat box, which we do save and share with the tellers later and is really nice for everyone. You can also use the chat to put in questions that occur to you because there will be a little bit of time after the stories for some Q and A. Tonight's show is our fourth ever featured teller show where we have just one person share a number of stories. Martha Reed Johnson is our teller tonight, bringing us four stories on the theme of lessons learned all family stories of the lessons her dad taught her through adventure and exploration. Our MC tonight is Pat Spaulding, so join me with another very visual way of welcoming Pat. Welcome, Pat. Thank you so much. Hello, hello. I'm uh, really happy to introduce our featured teller, Martha Reed Johnson, is an elementary and middle school counselor in Southern New Hampshire who resides just across the border in Massachusetts. She lives in a multi-generational home with a cast of characters whose adventures and misadventures <laughs> provide a daily treasure trove of story material. Martha looks forward to joining the virtual stage for storytelling for her very first time tonight. All right, Martha, we welcome you here. And we likewise look forward to hearing 
four of your family stories, <clears throat> all rooted in a deep love for the great outdoors. Martha's stories will describe lessons that her dad taught the family through his sense of adventure and exploration. Her first story is titled Out, The Misadventures of Dad's Polar Bear. Okay, that title certainly has stirred my curiosity. I suppose it may have stirred yours as well. So let's hear more. Martha, come on stage. Thank you, Pat. This story begins a long time ago. It really starts about the time I grew legs that worked. And I was the fourth of five children. And there was Brian, Chris, Eric, me, and my sister, Beth. There was a five year difference between my brother, Eric, and my, me, and then my sister was two years younger. So my three older brothers, well, wherever they were, that's where I wanted to be. And so as soon as I sprung legs that I could make work, I was on the chase and where they were, I was heading that direction. It created some problems for my mother because about the time that my legs got real working, my sister was born and you know my mother was taking care of a little baby. And so sometimes her focus was diverted. And every once in a while, she would get a phone call from our neighbor on Magnolia Terrace, Mrs. Gilman, who sat on her porch all the time watching the goings on. And Mrs. Gilman would call my mother and say, <clears throat> Faith, do you know where Marty is? And my mother would look up and say, oh, actually, no. And Mrs. Gilman said, well, you better step outside on your porch because you might want to know where she is. And my mother would come outside on the porch and there I was out on the edge of the street where the puddles formed and the mud was perfect. And I would sit there in the mud playing in the puddles watching my brothers on the terrace playing ball. And my mother would come and, and get me and bring me back into the house. Well, after a few calls from Mrs. Gilman, my mom decided that she needed to do something. So she said to my dad, Ted, I just need a break, just like Saturday mornings or just do something with Marty so that I know where she is. And he said, okay. So he loaded me in the station wagon and we went off to the lumber yard. And we came back with a way back of the station wagon full of lumber. And he dumped all the lumber in the backyard and he kind of set it out. Now the backyard, my mother could see from the kitchen because the kitchen had windows all along the back and she could look out into the yard and she could see the yard. So he positioned you know, the lumber right where my mother would be able to look out the window and see. And he started to build this, well, it was a pen. And he had me help. He gave me my own little hammer and you know some nails and he started building this big pen in the backyard. It was about, 10 by 10. He thought it was plenty big enough. And I helped him build it. And when it was done, he gave me a paintbrush and he gave me some paint and he said, well, let's paint it. So I started painting it. And that was great. And then my father walked away and we'd been on this project, you know, for several days, kept me occupied, but I got bored of the painting part pretty quickly. And so I climbed over the pen and I chased after my dad and I said, what are we going to do next? And he looked at me and he looked at the pen and he said, well, I guess we take it down. So that occupied a, a few more you know, hours of our time taking down the pen. My mother still said, I don't care if the pen's there or not, but she's yours on Saturday mornings. I'm just off duty. He said, okay. And that began a Saturday tradition that lasted for years. The Saturday mornings with dad, my brothers would be off doing their sports thing. My mother would be playing with Beth and my dad and I would have our, down, our time. He would make pancakes for breakfast. And then most often we would go out the front door down the porch and we would walk down Magnolia Terrace. We would get down, down to the end of the street and there was a meadow and we'd cross the meadow and we'd find a trail that went through the woods and winded down through the woods to the Forest Park Zoo in Springfield, Massachusetts of Dr. Seuss fame. He was once the zookeeper there. And we got to the zoo and we would go to see the giraffes and we'd see the monkeys We'd go to the reptile house. And then there was a path that would take us to a place where there was a playground on one side and opposite the playground was this 10 foot by 10 foot cage attached to a big cinder block building. And that's where the polar bear lived. And in front of that cage, there was a, a path 
that was kind of wide enough for like a golf cart to go in front of it. And there was a split rail fence. And when we would get to the polar bear cage, my father and I would stand there. My father would just stare at the cage and the polar bear would be pacing back and forth, back and forth. And my dad would just stare at them. And eventually the polar bear would stop and stare back at my dad. And I would watch my dad staring at the polar bear and the polar bear staring back for what seemed like forever. I would get a little restless and so I had to go over to the park and so I'd go and play on the swings and I'd climb up the big slide and I'd watch them from the top of the slide. And then I'd slide down and go over to my dad and I'd grab his hand and start pulling on it. And he'd look down and he'd say, okay, we'll go on now. And we'd go visit more of the zoo and then we'd hit the trails through the woods. We'd cross the meadow, we'd walk down Magnolia Terrace and we'd be home and our Saturday time was done. Well, one day when we were walking back from the zoo, after staring what seemed like a long time, I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, what does the polar bear say to you? My dad looked down at me and he said, out. I thought, I can relate to that. Well, the next week we went down to the polar bear cage. We went down Magnolia Terrace, we crossed the meadow, we walked through the windy path through the woods, we walked down the paths from the zoo, we saw the giraffes and the monkeys and we went through the reptile house and then we walked down the path to the polar bear cage. We stood at the split rail fence and my dad stared into the cage but it was empty and that happened sometimes and we would just wait and eventually the polar bear would come out and begin to stare at my dad. But we waited for a long time and the polar bear didn't come out. And I kept looking at my dad, looking at the empty cage. And then my dad looked up and in the top corner of the cage, he noticed that it had been cut and pulled back and there was a gaping hole. And my dad just stared at the hole. And then after a while, and we'd been there for, it seemed like forever, this, the zookeeper came by in his little cart and he often you know, would come by and he'd say, hi, Mr. Johnson, hi, Marty, how are you today? But he stopped and he looked at my dad and he said, oh, Mr. Johnson, I am really sorry to tell you this, but earlier in the week, some teenage boys tried to get into the polar bear cage. They snipped the corner and they pulled back the cage and one of the boys got halfway in and the polar bear mauled his leg. He said, the boy's okay, he got some stitches, but the bear, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson, but we had to shoot the bear. And my dad just seemed to melt in that standing position and just continued to stare at the cage. He didn't say a word. And then the zookeeper eventually drove off in his cart. And I stood there with my dad, staring at him as he stared into that empty cage. I didn't go play on the playground. I just stayed with my dad. And after a while, he looked down at me and he said, let's go. And we walked through the zoo, past the reptiles and the monkeys and the giraffes. We walked through the winding path through the woods. We walked across the meadow and we walked down Magnolia Terrace. And we were just about home. And my dad stopped in the middle of the road and he said, they shot the, the bear. Why didn't they shoot the kid? And I thought, well, okay, lesson learned. And that's the story of my dad and the polar bear. Oh, that's so beautifully sad. Um, yeah, what a, what a compelling story. Um, and I, I love traveling with you to that zoo and being right there staring at the polar bear with your dad. You were a very respectful kid. That's, that's pretty good bonding. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, I can wait. Okay, I can wait some more. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. That was, that was a really good story. Next up, um, Martha is <laughs> actually, actually, I think oh, we're going to show pictures. 
Yeah, I have. Oh, I forgot. Was well, that the order of things? I'm sorry. I I should have gone over that at the beginning. I was thinking we were saving it till the end of all of them. Okay. Yeah. Let's see some photos. Okay. I'm just reminding you, so you all can start to get a sense of. Um, <laughs> push this there we go so Mars I want to tell us this is my dad and this is typical dad not even pose that's just typical dad <laughs> <laughs> he's not imitating a polar bear no he's just my dad and you know it's interesting as he got older and he has this you know his beard was orange and then it turned deep red but as he got older and he turned white and his hair got white we used to laugh because he was a big guy that he looked like the polar bear that he loved as he aged. So. and that's me painting my pen <laughs> Lasted, yeah, you could climb those walls. <laughs> not even, not even an hour after my dad was done. So yeah, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> so you can see our Saturday started when I was pretty little, and I think I was about um, six when the polar bear incident happened. Yeah, he definitely. Um, well, sounds like he's going to be teaching you some lessons about capability. <laughs> that was like one when you're two. Here's a paintbrush. Figure out how to paint your pen. <laughs> then we'll put you in it and it'll be great. Um, <laughs> okay, story number two coming up with Martha sharing lessons learned when a family of six her family is crammed into a station wagon for eight weeks. Oh boy. <laughs> the title of this one is Don't Leave Family Behind. All righty, Martha, take it away. Yeah. This one could also be called Lessons from the Way Back. And I think that many of you are old enough to know about the way back of the station wagon. And that was the place that my sister and I had in the station wagon. So on this particular trip across country from Massachusetts to California and then back through Canada, um, we took eight weeks in the station wagon to do this, this wonderful trip. <clears throat> and the oldest Brian was off, you know, doing his own college thing. So it was Chris and Eric, teenagers, my sister and I, five and seven in the way back of the station wagon. My mom and dad in the front seat. As you know, there was no air conditioning. There was no videos to watch not even music to listen to, AM radio across the country. No, not so much. Um, and we all crammed in the station wagon and then we pulled a little small sailboat on a trailer behind us that kept all the camping gear. And the most memorable item of the camping gear was we had this tent that was huge so that all six of us you know, could fit in it. And it took up most of the boat when we folded it up as small as it could go. It was this heavy canvas material. Maybe some of you as kids camped in such a tent. It probably weighed a hundred pounds that we would have to fold it up and lift it into the boat and dump it in there. And it had these silver poles you put together to hold the tent up. Except our tent had been so well worn that the poles didn't really hold up the tent so well. So there was a couple rules for our family in camping. And they were basically two. Campsites must have trees to hold up the tent and campsites must be close to a bathroom so that mom can get up and get to the bathroom first thing in the morning. Those were the two rules. The other rules were everyone had their spot in the station wagon. So my sister and I were always in the way back, my two brothers in the, middle, in the back seat and mom and dad driving. So we started our adventure, Massachusetts to California visiting you know, national parks along the way. And it didn't take very long for my sister and I to learn our first lesson. We were in the way back and the wind was blowing through the car because there's no air conditioning and the wind was blowing and I pulled out a pack of Trident gum, you know, the little pieces of gum with the little gum wrappers? Well, suddenly that wind caught one of those wrappers and it flew out the window. I do not know how my father saw that, but he did. And he immediately pulled over the station wagon and made, got out of the station wagon. He went back to the boat where the camping gear was. He unfolded the tarp cover and found a big hefty trash bag. He went over to the back window of the wagon and he said, girls, 
you got to pick up some trash. You don't litter. So my sister and I spend a good, you know, hour picking up trash on the side of the road while mom and dad and my brothers, you know, sat there sipping lemonade watching us. Didn't seem too concerned about how long it took. And, you know, we would get to where we were going to get to eventually and picked up the trash. And then we had to keep the trash with us in the way back until we got to the first gas station where we could dump the trash. But I knew that it wouldn't be long before we would be stopping at a gas station because there was two things, two things I had already learned on just the first couple of days of this journey is that you wouldn't go far before mom had to go to the bathroom and be stopping at a gas station or dad needed to take a picture of something beautiful on the side of the road and we'd be stopping for him to break out all the filters and take 20 shots of one flower. And that's how the trip went. And that's, I guess, why it took eight weeks. But when we got to Yosemite National Park, we got to a campsite, we perfect, we put up the tent, we had plenty of trees to hang the, you know, the tent to keep it from falling down. And we started off on a hike. <clears throat> and of course, I had to keep up with my brothers because that was just what I wanted to do. So I was off and running with the boys off on the hike. My mother and my father and my sister were kind of lagging behind when my brothers and I got up to the top of a waterfall and it was beautiful. And I just remember the sound of that water just crashing over the rocks. And I wanted to get really close and I was getting really close. And I heard my mother's voice from down below yelling, she's going to fall. And then I heard my father's voice say, don't worry, I got it. And I looked as I was leaning over to the water and my father was pulling out his camera while my brother grabbed hold of my ankles and Chris pulled me in from the waterfall. But dad got the shot and I learned, hm, brothers don't let you down. Well, not all campsites were like we found at Yosemite. And not too far down, a few more weeks down the road, we ended up at a campsite that was actually the overflow campsite for the campsite that we had a reservation for. And the overflow campsite was just a meadow. And the meadow had a long road down the middle of it. There was porta potties up at the front. And then you rode down this kind of gravel path looking for a place to put your tent up while you waited until the next day you could get into your reserve spot in the National Park. Well, we drove down through this meadow and my mother was watching the porta potties get farther and farther behind until we came to a spot in the meadow that we could put up the tent. And the meadow had no trees. So we got the tent up with the big silver poles as best we could and my dad took stock of it and thought, well, looks pretty steady, but just to be safe, he decided he would tie the front of the tent to the top of the station wagon so that at least if the tent collapsed, the, the front of the tent would stay up. And if we slept with our heads at the front of the tent, you know, we wouldn't be crushed in the middle of the night, I guess. So it worked. And we went into the tent. And as we did every night, we read stories. My dad always picked books to read. And they were usually adventure stories about families on adventures that would kind of give us a preview to our next year's adventure. And that summer he had chosen to read the book, my father was an avid sailor, about sailing with a family around the world. And he was trying to sell us on this project. And so he was reading this book called Survive the Savage Sea. Now, that's not the title I would choose to sell your family on sailing around the world. That's a whole nother story. But he read us to sleep, and it was hard to go to sleep listening to this family getting attacked by hammerhead sharks, but we did and we fell asleep. And in the morning, you know, the early birds like myself and my dad were up out of the tent. We were getting the things around the picnic table for breakfast and we saw my mother bolt out of the tent. My brother's still sleeping in the tent. My sister's still sleeping in the tent. And my mother with this wild eyed look comes out of the tent and she looks and then realizes where we are. And she looks down the road way down to where the porta, porta potties are and realizes she's not gonna make it, but she's not dumb. So she gets into the car, she starts the engine. Then as soon as the engine started, my father started to scream, stop, stop. But she didn't hear him and drove off with a tent dragging behind with, you know, some of my brothers and sisters still back there, you know. Eventually she stopped, got out of the car and made the run for the porta potties. Well, the rest of us had to untangle the tent and the poles and get my sister and my brothers out of the tent. And we dragged the tent back to the site and were able to you know, have our breakfast. 
but we looked around and noticed that everybody in this overflow campground was watching us like, those people are crazy. And perhaps we were just a little bit. Well, we survived that. And we survived about five more weeks in the station wagon with my sister learning to whistle and sing. And she never stopped. It was constant. She would whistle a song that she, we were supposed to know, but she couldn't really tell it was a song. It was just loud whistling. And then she would sing, and then she would want to tell stories. And she never stopped talking day after day after day in the car. And it was getting a little tiring. And the trip was again taking long for gas station stops and picture stops. And one day we pulled into a gas station. We were in Canada somewhere. I don't know where, but there wasn't a lot around. But we pulled into a gas station and everybody piled out use the restrooms and we piled back in the car and my dad pulled away and I realized immediately that my sister was not in the car with us. And I leaned over the back seat between my brothers to tell my mom and dad that Beth wasn't in the car and my brothers grabbed my shoulders and they pinched me and they said, don't you say a word. And I didn't. I stayed absolutely silent. And we drove on down the road another 15, 20 minutes. It may seem like hours until finally my dad pulled over on the side of the road. He said, why is it so quiet in this car? Everybody out. And he made us get on the side of the road. He lined us up and he counted. And he looked and he said, where's your sister? And I broke down sobbing. I said, we left her in the gas station back there and they wouldn't let me tell you. And my father looked at us. And he said, you don't leave family behind. And then he said to my mom, Faith, get in the car. And he looked at my brothers and I, and he said, you three can wait here. And mom and dad drove off to get my sister. And there I was sitting by the side of the road with my two older brothers. And mom and dad eventually came back. We managed to arrive back home in our own driveway on Magnolia Terrace. And we'd left nobody behind. And we have thousands of pictures to tell the story. And that's the lessons from the way back. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Yeah, your father had very imaginative ways of uh, getting his point across. So, <laughs> have we got some photos of, of this one too? Yeah, he would be arrested now, but in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is um, three of the five of us. This is my brother, Eric. Um, and we all have, you can tell, great haircuts because, you know, well, dad did the haircuts in the house. So there you have it. <laughs> the head. And I wouldn't really let him near mine. So mine's the one with the crazy hair. Um, but that's mom, dad, and the three out of five of us. And now you can see many, many years later, my dad looking like the polar bear. And yep. there's the five of us. We did not leave anyone behind. We are all still there and we are all still, you know, intact. Um, my oldest brother, Brian, Brian is no longer with us, but we are all still intact. So handsome family <laughs> that's that's great another good story martha <laughs> i um i have experience when i was a kid too with one of those great big canvas tents that my folks actually um when i was four three and a half four about set it up at hampton beach there was a, a campground at hampton beach this would be back in the 50s early fifties. And um, yeah, you could camp at the beach. And it was, I remember the smell of that tent, you know, that, that heavy yes. canvas. Oh, and when the water would pool and if you just touched the water, it would just like yeah. pool, rain down inside you. Yeah. <laughs> A lovely thing. Yeah. Wonderful living experience. Yep. <laughs> All right. We've got another story coming right up here. Um, Martha says that for her family, the summer of 1974 began in the fall of 73 when their dad read a book titled 
How to Build a Cabin in the Woods. Oh boy, this is going to be good. The story's title is Must Find Wilderness. All right, Martha. So the title of the story <clears throat> I found a few years after my dad died. I found a journal that he wrote in the end of the summer of 1973 after our family camping trip to California and um, before our 1974 adventure. And the journal starts with the very first words, my family is no longer fit for public camping, must find wilderness. And he did. My dad and my uncle went to a land auction in Boston in the fall of 1973 and sight unseen bought 100 acres of wilderness land in Nova Scotia, Canada. And he came home to tell my mother that he had spent $1,000. My uncle had also spent $1,000. They had split the $2,000 cost of this 100 acre wilderness and that he was going to take us all on an adventure to build a cabin in the woods because nobody wanted to sail around the world. And my mother looked at my dad and she said, whoa, hold up. First of all, rule number one, we don't spend $200 in this marriage without consulting with each other. You broke that rule. She wasn't happy. Second, she said, there is no way I am taking five kids to the wilderness of Nova Scotia if I haven't seen what I'm getting myself into. And he said, oh, well, there's a clause. So you can actually go look at the land and within 30 days and we can get out of it if we need to. She said, well, that's gonna happen. And so my uncle and my mother flew to Nova Scotia to see the 100 acre wilderness. And my mother saw it. It was a lot of trees and no water. And she called my dad and said, absolutely not. If we have to spend eight weeks in the wilderness of Nova Scotia, there's gonna be water and there's gonna be a place we can get supplies because you can build your cabin in the woods, but I'm not feeding this family off the land. So those were her conditions. So the Realty Company, company found another wonderful piece of property, showed my mom, my uncle, and that is how it came to pass that the Johnson clan had 50 acres of wilderness land somewhere near Hectanooga, Nova Scotia, which is near nothing, and on a little place called Hunter Pond, which was one of three ponds that was connected by, by little waterways to three other ponds. So our little lit spot on Hunter Pond, 50 acres. And so that fall, my father began reading his book, How to Build a Cabin in the Woods. He read it all year long. And when school got out in June, we packed the station wagon, we packed the camping, the boat full of the camping supplies. And this time, we had a canoe on top of the roof of the car that was put right side up <clears throat> so that inside of the canoe, there were big two-person saws and little hand saws and hatchets and axes and chisels, three windows, and a couple of kitchen chairs strapped to the top. My three brothers got into the middle back seat. My sister and I took our spot in the way back the box. Mom and dad got into the front and off we went on two-day drive. To Nova Scotia. When we got to our land, we learned that we could only get to our land on the pond by either sailing or canoeing across the pond or hiking about two miles from a logging trail on the back side of the property. Well, we found a clearing that was kind of on the back side of the property. We set up our tent, we found some trees, we tied it up. We were exhausted and we went to go to sleep. This trip, we had brought our German Shepherd dog. And the first night he took off for the woods and he didn't come back for a long time. But when he came back, we heard him crying before he arrived and his mouth was wide open, full of porcupine quills. His eyebrows were full of porcupine quills, the ears, all of his breast was full of porcupine quills. And that night, by the candlelight of a lantern and flashlights and candles, we learned that the most effective way to get porcupine quills out of a dog is to clip the end, release the suction and pull the quill. So we clipped and pulled and clipped and pulled until we got every last quill out, pretty much as the sun was coming up. And that was our first night in Nova Scotia. Timmy survived and he survived a few more porcupines over the course of this trip. 
But we found our little spot that my dad wanted to build the land, build our cabin, like right, you know, on the edge of the water, just up a little hill, and decided it was perfect. And we spent the next couple of days ferrying all of our gear across the lake in the canoe and the sailboat and hiking in from the logging trail to get our camp set up <clears throat> to begin building our log cabin in the woods. We quickly set a rhythm to the day. In the morning we would get up, my brothers would grab with my dad the two person saws and they would partner up and they would cut down the trees by hand. There were no power tools, there were no wheels, there was just us and these hand tools. And they would cut down the trees and we quickly learned that when you cut down a tree in the forest, it will start to fall, but it may not fall all the way. It'll get caught up in the canopy. And so my brothers would shimmy up the tree with the hand saws and they would saw the branches so that the trees would then begin to fall through the tree, the canopies. It was awesome to watch. And I thought, I want to ride a tree. Dad, please, can I ride a tree? And he looked at me and I was eight. My sister was six and he said, you're too little to climb trees. I have just the job for you. So my sister and I, we got to build the foundation of the cabin. He said that was the most important thing. And so our job was to go to the edge of the pond and pick up rocks and carry them up the hill and drop them in the middle of where the clearing was. And that was gonna be the foundation. So my sister and I would pick up rocks and carry them up the hill and pick up rocks and carry them up the hill. And when our attention would wander and we'd start swimming or doing something else, we would hear my father yelling, bring more rocks and we would carry more rocks up the hill as we listened to the trees crashing and watching my brothers flying down through the woods. And we stacked up trees and we quickly learned that you needed to peel the bark off the trees right away. Because if you waited a couple of days, it just came off in little like little tiny little chinks. But if you did it right after the trees came, trees came down, you could strip the bark in big, huge strips. It was really sticky. So we, each morning we got up, the boys cut the trees, my sister and I carried rocks, and each day we gathered for lunch. We'd eat lunch and then we'd spend a couple hours stripping the bark from the trees. It was sticky stuff. In the late afternoon we could swim and canoe and sail and have fun. We'd have our dinners by the campfire. My dad would read us stories of families that lived in the wilderness. And then we'd get up the next day and do it all over again. And one day when we were stripping the bark off of the trees, <clears throat> the chisel you know, would get sticky in your hands. And Eric had a chisel and he was trying to get it unstuck from his hand. He shook his hand and when he shook his hand, the chisel flew across the clearing and the blade came down and it sliced my sister from her top of her leg, on her, from her knee on her shin down to her ankle. And there was blood gushing out of her leg. It was terrifying. And suddenly my father was screaming and barking orders. Chris had to run through the woods to get to the car and drive it around to the lakeside where we could sail the boat. Eric and Brian were setting up the boat and my the sailboat so we could sail across. My mother was holding my sister and I was holding my sister's hand while my dad bandaged up her leg all the time shouting directions as to who was to do what. And everybody quickly did what they needed to do. We got my sister into the boat, my mom, my dad, and I sailed across the lake. Just as we got to the other side, my brother Chris pulled up into the station wagon. He got out, we got into the car, we drove away. My brother was a competitive sweater, swimmer, and that's why he was the driver, because we he left the boat there at the, that side of the lake. My brother swam back over to the cabin, and my brothers continued to cut down trees and ride them down. My mother, my dad, and I, and my sister went off to the emergency room. We got there in time. My sister's leg was stitched up. And you know, what we remember most about that trip was that on the way into the hospital, she got stung by a bee that really made her mad. And she was upset about that. I think she was in shock about the leg. She never seemed to care, never said anything about it. But the bee sting, that was like over the top. But we got her back into the car after being stitched up. And we drove all the way back to the land at Hunter Pond, somewhere near Hectanuga. And we got to the boat and it was pitch black at night. There wasn't a star in the sky. There was no moon. I have never seen nor remember since such blackness. And we got into the sailboat and my dad picked up the oars and he just started rowing across the still gla glass lake. It just was perfect. But we couldn't see where we were going. So my dad started to yell, hello, hello, hello. And it just echoed all over the lake. 
until finally we started hearing voices over here, 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 echoing. But with all the echoes, we couldn't tell where the sounds were coming from. My dad just kept rowing the boat. And then we saw three little lights, my brother's flashlights standing on the edge of the lake. My dad rowed the boat and we got back to our spot on the Edger Hunter Pond. We all got into the tent that night. There were no stories read or told that night. We all just fell asleep. But in the morning, we got up and my brothers began to saw down the trees and stack them. I carried rocks all by myself. My sister got to sit with her leg propped up and I carried rock after rock and listened to my dad yell, bring more rocks. In six weeks time, my family had built a 12 by 16 cabin in the woods over a beautiful pond called Hunter Pond where we watched purple sunsets, listened to stories. And to this day, that cabin still stands because it was built on a strong foundation. <laughs> Definitely a strong foundation. <laughs> I totally believe that too. <laughs> we have pictures to prove it. <laughs> okay, let's see them. Well, there you can see part of our gearing up. That is, you know, the classic Ted Johnson move. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing the, sta the state wagon move because you know then we hadn't even attached the boat to it yet. So there you go. So wow. Yeah. So this is um actually a few years later because this is my older brother Chris and this is me probably at twelve or thirteen. Um, I was old enough to cut down the trees with a saw and begin to learn how to ride the trees. So. Ah. <laughs> and this is building. This is my brother Chris who's with the red hat and my brother Eric. Uh, and that's that's what it looked like as we were building this little cabin. You can see the water in the little blue and water back through the trees. Oh yeah, looks like wilderness shows that I have seen lately on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And there's our finished little cabin, and that's our that was our kitchen in the foreground there, the little campfire with our little kitchen set up. Yep, mm -hmm. that's where for eight weeks my mother prepared food for seven people every day, three times a day. And that's the inside. And um, this is years later, you know, we, we, I spent all my summers at this cabin from the time I was eight until I was off to college. Wow. Times through college. So um, that's where I would spend anywhere from four to eight weeks each summer when school would get out. Um, it, it got improved. My sister and I actually put a hardwood floor into that cabin. And a few years ago, after my dad died, um, my sister went up to the cabin and she took a picture of the floor. She said, our floor is still here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. And those are our lovely sunsets on the, on the lake. Beautiful. So, yeah. Boy, so the, the family that plays together like that stays together. It sounds like you had quite a bond. It also, as I'm listening to these stories, Sounds like your mother was a really good sport. Oh, I mean, she was. <laughs> she, <laughs> she just she had was. to enjoy the antics that your dad brought to, to light with the kids. And yeah, and she was an adventurous spirit in herself. Otherwise, clearly she wouldn't have done it. And she, and you know, yeah. and she did it mostly with with enthusiasm. And but she also had a practicality about her, you know, such that no, Ted, we're not gonna live off the land. We're gonna go for a supply run every Sunday every set it was every Saturday we had every we would work six days every Saturday we would go on a supply run to get a ton of groceries and haul them across you know the lake in the in the canoe and the sailboat and we would go see something in Nova Scotia we would you know explore a little bit on on our supply runs to Yarmouth um, Nova Scotia so she was um, a good balance yes that's pretty great and you're still living with her and you can share some stories still I think those have to come later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to um, enjoy Martha's final story titled Smiles in the Sky. And it's about finding family stories and the search for more about mining for family treasure, which you certainly have done tonight. And 
Glad to hear another one, Martha. So, as I mentioned earlier, a few years after my father passed away, I found a journal that he had written. And it started in the summer that we, it was his summer, it was his Nova Scotia journal of building the log cabin in the woods. And, you know, as a family, we shared stories of that experience our whole lives and learned that we all had different perspectives of each of our experiences there, which was fascinating to hear. But to see my dad's words written down for the very first time, see the words that we weren't fit for public camping and that's why all this happened was a little stunning. Um, but then I saw that there was references early on in the trip, you know, the first one being, you know, not too long after the first porcupine incident. And then um, after my sister getting hurt, my father would write in the journal, Faith is ready to go home and abandon the project, must do something. And the next page of the story would say, took Faith camping, took Faith canoeing. And then the next page would be about what we did the next day. We obviously stayed for eight weeks, but every, every now and then there would be this entry in this journal, took faith canoeing, smiley face. Took faith canoeing, smiley face. And I started remembering that part of the rhythm of our time in Nova Scotia was when the afternoons we weren't working, there was sometimes my mom and dad would take off in the canoe and they would be gone for hours and they would canoe the little waterways to the other lakes. And my brothers and my sisters and I, we would just, you know, sail on the lake and we would canoe, we built rafts, we did all kinds of things. And just, you know, I just love to be in the woods. And mom and dad would come back and time for sunset and, and dinner. But I just wondered about those journal entries. So I said to my mom, you know, mom, what's the story here? Because I knew there was another story. And she said, what are you talking about? And I showed her, I said, mom, this, the journal, this took faith canoeing smiley faces, what's that? And my mother was, you know, about 80 years old and she got this smile on her face and her eyes lit up and she said, oh, Martha, let me tell you a story. She said, I think you're old enough for it now. She said, you know, your father and I loved to canoe. And when you all were small, you know, he was a teacher but he worked in Andover and you all went to school in Georgetown and Andover celebrated the Jewish holidays. So in September, when it was like a Jewish holiday, my dad didn't have to go to school. He would take us all to school. He'd go back home and mom and dad would put the canoe on top of the car and they would go off to Newburyport to Plum Island to go paddling. And this is the story my mother told me. She said, well, one day, we were paddling along and we brought a beautiful picnic. We found a lovely sandbar and we got out of the canoe. We parked the canoe in the sandbar and we put our blanket out. We had our picnic. We were having a lovely time. And your dad said, hey, let's go swimming. And I said, well, I don't have my, I don't, we don't have bathing suit. Yet. And Ted said, oh, that's fine. We'll just go skinny dipping. So we did. We went skinny dipping. And we went skinny dipping, splashing in the water it was beautiful. And then we got out of the, the water and we went to our blanket and we just started snuggling on the sandbar and then snuggling turned into, well, you get the picture, right, Marty? I said, yeah, Maya, I get the picture. She said, well, we were just so enjoying ourselves that we didn't notice that there was one of those, you know, planes that, that write things in the sky circling above us. But when we were finished, we looked up and there was a great big smiley face in the sky. I said, no way. And my mother, just with that little sparkle in her eyes, she said, oh, yes way. And I said, oh, I don't need to know anymore, mom. And I took the journal away. But then I remembered that as my parents were older, my dad got Parkinson's disease and it kind of, it just wrecked his body. And he was diagnosed in, in his late 50s, um, early 60s with Parkinson's. And he lived to be 81, but in the last year of his life, it was, it was really hard. And I was living in South Carolina at the time, but most summer vacations, I would come up here because I was smart, went into ed education to have summer wild adventures. And I came up to have my wild adventures with my dad and his Parkinson's and I would help my mom. And this one particular summer, my dad spent a, got a lot of time in the hospital and a rehab center. And we'd finally gotten him home. We got him settled. And that night I tucked him in, I tucked my mom in next to him and they were so happy to be back on their, on their double mattress. And I thought as I tucked them in and they were they laying there and I was watching my dad shake and my mom shaking and I thought, oh, how does she do it? But they were so happy to be back together. 
I tucked him in, I went off to my room to go to sleep. And about midnight, my mother knocked on the door and I thought something was wrong with my father and I bolted up out of bed and she said, no, no, your dad's okay, your dad's okay. And she said, I'm not feeling very well. Your brother's coming to get me and he's taking me to the hospital. You need to stay here with your dad. And so I did and I, I didn't wake him. I waited till the morning. It was just dawn as I was coming down that hallway and I hit this creek in the floorboard and my dad heard it and he said, Faith. And I opened up the door. I said, no, dad, it's me. He said, well, where's your mother? Oh, I cannot lie to my father. And I went and I sat down next to the bed. And I said, well, dad, mom didn't feel so good last night. So Eric, Took her to the hospital and and she's there today eric's checked in with me and everything's okay but they're they're gonna keep mom you know today and overnight and and um we'll see how she is tomorrow and my father sat up and he said well let's get dressed we have to go i said no dad you, we, we can stay home we'll we'll call and he said no he said your mother comes to spend the day with me every day that i'm in the hospital we're going to see your mother I said, okay, and I knew it was gonna be a lot to get him ready to go, but he wanted to get dressed in his very best, which meant a lot of buttons on his shirt, and we buttoned him up and tucked his shirt in and got his pants on, and they were so big that, you know, his suspenders had to hold him up, but then he got into the bathroom and sat down on his chair, and he got shaving cream, and he put it all over his face, above his beard and down below his beard, and he picked up a razor, and he said, you need to shave me, and I looked at my dad, you need to shave me. And I said, there's no way I'm going to shave you, dad. And he grabbed the razor from me and he said, I'll do it myself. And I stood there in the bathroom watching my dad as the razor got closer to his face. And I thought, oh, this is going to be ugly. But as soon as the blade hit his skin, he got perfectly still. And he shaved his face and his lip. And he shaved his neck. And he put the razor down and he said, your mother doesn't like to kiss whiskers. Okay, dad. He cleaned up the shaving cream. We got him cleaned up. I got him into the car, put the wheelchair in the back of the way back of the station wagon. And we drove off to the hospital and I had just barely parked the car and he started to open the door. I said, dad, wait, I got to get the chair out of the car. And I went to the way back. I got this wheel we wheelchair out. I brought it around to the passenger side. But before I had gotten to the passenger side, my dad had opened up the door and he had literally somersaulted out of the car and was sitting on the pavement with his head bleeding. bleeding. I said, dad, what did you do? He said, well, I get out that way sometime. And I said, well, it didn't go so well this time, dad. And he said, oh, 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 well, well, there's some duct tape in the, in the glove box, just stick it on my head. And I was like, uh, okay, no. And, you know, I'm smarter than that. And I got him patched up and we put his ball cap on his head and I wheeled him into the hospital. And as we were going past the gift shop, he st yelled, he said, stop, Marty, stop. I said, what? He said, we have to go get that. I said, what? And he pointed. And there on the shelf, there was this bright yellow bowl with a smiley face on it with his plants inside of it. I said, that? I said, that, that's hideous. He said, I have to get it for your mother. I said, what, the smiley face? vase with I, I was like no she he said go get that for your mother said, okay so I got this ugly smiley face bowl of flowers put it in his lap and off we went up to my mother's room and as I wheeled wheeled his wheelchair in he got to the next to her bed and he took the flowers and the smiley face and he placed it right in front of her on her tray with a smiley face facing her he said had to come see you today and my mother looked at the vase and the smile face and she looked at my dad and her eyes lit up and her face sparkled and I looked at my dad looking at my mom and I thought oh 60 years and they still look at each other like that and that's the story of smiles in the sky and a love affair of 60 years <laughs> and that smiley ugly face it sits in my office on my desk. It's still there. So, yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful reminder of um, parents that stayed in love. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, a love story, a total happy story. ending. A love story, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, good, we've got pictures. You've got pictures, yes. And that's, of course, it's not, you know, not a great picture of my mom and dad's wedding day, but it's the one we have. So that's mom and dad. 
and you know everyone should you know put yourselves in you know whatever that is <laughs> <laughs> guillotine guillotine <laughs> whatever <laughs> they are, yeah um and this is mom and dad canoeing on one of their classic uh they got into after the kids were grown they got into adventure canoeing and they would go off for you know week trips in their canoe with all their gear in their um canoe they got a much better tent by then i gave them a, a wonderful gift one year of a, of a nice little two-person tent that folded up real small for their canoe trips so wow but my dad you know ever the sailor had to rig something up so that it would ease the paddling so my mother could recline so that is a sail sort of yeah. okay and that's mom and dad years later so oh yeah. nice looking at that age too yeah that was probably in their late 70s so yeah wow both handsome <laughs> So those are my family adventure stories for the evening. So. Thank you, Martha. Those were wonderful, wonderful stories. And um, it, it's good that we've got, um, we only have a, a YouTube available so other people can see them who may not have been here tonight. Um, this is uh, really a, a fine selection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for having your cameras on so I can see your faces. It makes a big difference when you're telling a story. To faces. <laughs> I'm for glimpse. Um, and uh, I'm stepping in now. We actually don't have time for any Q and A, but we'll be going so that we'll be going straight to the interview after I I say a few things here. Um, but um, keep the comments coming. And sure that Martha will really appreciate looking at those later. And as I said, I'm just going to give you a little bit of info before we move to the interview that David will do of Martha. So thanks to everyone for being with us tonight. And thanks to Martha for putting in that time and effort to pull these all together, find the photos, and create this lovely evening for us. And special thanks to our live audience, so many of whom even had their cameras on tonight. Yay, it was so good to see you. Um, as I said, we're soon to move to the backstory interview. But let me let, let you know this first. We are entering our summer hiatus. So our next True Tales Live Zoom show is going to be on Tuesday, September 27th at, yeah, at 7 p.m. Go to truetaleslivenh.org to get the link and re to register for that. We are really not sure yet if any of our fall shows will be in person. There's a possibility that September and October would be. So just keep in touch with us. You can watch our website. You can watch our Facebook page. You can join our email list to be kept in the loop on that. And we would love to hear your story. We have a few open slots for tellers this fall. You can find info on that on our website and Facebook page. We encourage you to attend one of our monthly workshops on Zoom, 7 to 8.30 p.m. on most first Tuesdays of the month. The next one coming up on July 5th, they'll actually run through the summer and remain on Zoom for the full year. You can contact us at info at truetaleslivenh.org or also again go to truetaleslivenh.org for more information and links to register for the workshops as well as audience for the show. Watch us on Portsmouth Public Media TV, Comcast Channel 98, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m., Saturdays at 1 p.m., and anytime as video on demand or as a podcast. TrueTalesLiveNH.org will let you easily access all of those options. Let's thank some of those who make this show possible. John Lovering, Pat Spaulding, David Frainer, Sarah Beddingfield, Kamisha Foley, Tom Osberg, and Tina Charpentier. I'm Amy Antonucci, and before we move on to the Backstory 15-minute interview, please join us for a minute of movement and fun for our True Tales dance party. Shake off the cobwebs of sitting for an hour by Zoom. We have a great time with this. So you might wanna make sure your video's on and at least, you know, if you just wanna do this, that's fine. But some of us are pushing our chairs aside and getting up. And if you're in gallery view, we can really do this together. So John, you can get that music started.
And welcome to our back story conversation with our featured storyteller, Martha Reed Johnson. Martha, thank you so much for your stories. As Pat says, we're all overclimped. And thank you for joining this conversation. You shared that this is your first return to storytelling since the pausing for the pandemic. Yeah. And we're glad you picked us to uh, get back in gear with. So perhaps we can begin there. Besides pausing for stories, pausing your storytelling, what are some of the other ways that the pandemic has influenced you as a teller? Has it generated new stories or new insights to storytelling? Um, yeah, I have been, um, I moved back to Massachusetts five years ago um, to keep my mother and the family home. And um, so, then we entered a pandemic where we were pretty much home, mom and I. And um, so it's given me a lot of time with my mother to um, hear some of her stories and some of her life stories. And that has been um, amazing. And I feel like it's, it's also become kind of a little bit of a responsibility of gathering the stories to tell my siblings that don't even know some of mom's early childhood stories and and her life growing up in the you know 30s 40s you know 50s and and what her life was like you know hearing her perspective of our family adventure stories has also been fascinating so that's where I kind of got interested in just how do you mine family stories how do you turn um, a conversation away from the daily ugh of this ailment or that ailment or this, you know, thing that's happening to finding what have been the precious moments in people's lives, you know? So asking my mother, you know, what do you remember most about this? Or what was your favorite childhood memory? Or pulling out old pictures with her. And then she'll tell the story of the people in those photographs. And um, it gets her retelling her story and thinking about, you know, some very happy memories. And um, sometimes that's a nice place when my mother's really feeling discouraged, being 89 is hard. Um, sometimes it's nice to take her back to her childhood and, and then to be gathering those stories is nice. Somewhat like our own Amy Antonucci, you do feature dad stories clearly, um, which leads me to uh, think that maybe we need to have a theme called dad stories, but I digress. <laughs> you, have, you did note to me that um, your siblings tell stories from slightly different, slightly shifted perspectives. Well, it's and you know, uh, so and it makes for a kind of different lens. So tell us a little bit about that and how that influences your storytelling. And well, are your siblings also storytellers? No, I mean other than just around the family right. gatherings, you know. But um, this really came to light to me um, many years ago on a Christmas gathering <clears throat> and my sister was wearing, you know, a beautiful dress, but it was kind of like knee, knee length. And um, so her legs were showing and she sports a pretty significant scar from that, you know, incident in Nova Scotia. Right. And um, so we were all sitting around the living room and my sister was just swinging her leg and sporting her scar. She didn't think about it anymore at all. And my brother, Chris said, oh my God, Beth, I feel so bad that I did that to you. And we all just stopped, we went, what? And everyone said, Chris, you didn't do it. Eric said, I did it. And we all said, yeah, Eric did it. You didn't do it. Eric did it. But for apparently 30 years, my brother Chris thought that he was the one who had really? let go of the chisel and splayed her leg. And he was blown away that his memory was so far off. And, you know, I kind of you know, I've studied trauma a lot and, and it kind of started thinking, wait a minute, this was a traumatic experience for our family. So we all did, you know, experience it in a different way. And I think my brother, Chris, felt a big responsibility that he was given the task of running through the woods to get to the car, which was crucial to getting my sister help in time. And he had to get that car, you know, around to the other side mm -hmm. of the lake so that we could you know, my parents could get her to the hospital. And I think that that just experience weighed heavy. My mother then realized, she said, oh, that was a lot, you know, 
Um, and and just you know the way we all began to kind of re-experience that story was very interesting. And my sister was like, I don't really remember any of it. <laughs> you know? But the rest of us had very vivid memories wow. of it. You know? So yeah. And like our own uh, Tom Osberg, you are an outdoor adventure storyteller. You bring that appreciation for the outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if we might talk about that as that's sort of a subtext of your stories for this evening, about how do you turn outdoor activities into stories? Do you sense in advance that a particular outdoor activity is going to turn into a story, or do they evolve? How's that um, not really, but with outdoor adventures there's also there's often mishaps or something goes wrong and the best stories are all about trouble and things that go wrong right. when things go right. smoothly there's no story really right. you know? exactly right yes. um so i think that's why um outdoor adventure fosters great stories because there's always something that goes wrong and um and then being able to you know find the humor in it find the lesson in it find the common experience you know in it because i think stories to be truly meaningful to the listener have to resonate in some way with their life you know and um and i know you know in sharing some of my stories of my childhood i thought my family was normal i thought like <laughs> everybody did these like summer adventures until i started as a grown-up telling stories and people would look at me like what you did they and i was like you mean you guys didn't do that <laughs> and so it was you know, I was, had a little different experience, but I also realized that there was common family experiences even that thread through the crazy of my family, you know, that other families could relate to. Someone coined the phrase sandwich generation for adults caring for a parent while being helpful to an adult child. And as Pat mentioned, and you did too, you live in a four generation household so I think we should call you part of the super sandwich generation. And it reminds me of that old TV series, The Waltons, which certainly <laughs> celebrated storytelling. So share with us a little bit about your uh, adventures and misadventures that are a function of this four generation household. Well, it's an interesting place to be sometimes. Um, thankfully, Busy for sure. Yes, thankfully we were in the house that um, I grew up in that, you know, my parents raised, you know, five kids and also had grandparents living with us when I was a kid. So there's, we have room to kind of spread out. So we're not like on top of each other, which is pretty nice. But um, it's cr created like, you know, my granddaughter is one years old. Right. And, um, it has been such a blessing to have her in the house because she brings such joy to my mother and you know getting old is hard and my mother is you know seeing friends that are you know she doesn't see friends anymore she talks to people on the phone but she has trouble getting out and people have trouble getting to her and the whole pandemic so she's been pretty isolated and um and i was really worried a year ago that she was getting really kind of isolated and depressed but then isabel came into the picture and has just brought joy and laughter and something that my mother gets so excited about seeing her. And, um, and then it's just amazing to watch your son be a dad. Whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my son, Joel, who's the dad was of my two boys was my challenge kid. Oh, he was a wild child. And to watch him be a really good dad, um, to be playful. He reminds me of my dad, you know, in the playful way that he is with his <laughs> daughter and, um, so I know that in the years to come, there will be stories to tell about those two, the Joel and Izzy stories, that they're coming for sure. One other thing I wanted to chat with you about, uh, you're a counselor mm -hmm. for elementary and middle school kids. And as a retired minister, I appreciate the role that stories have played in my own work as in pastoral counseling. And I wonder, do you use storytelling in your counseling work? I, I do, um, and I always end up feeling like I've not done it enough, and so it's always like as I look into the year coming up that I want to do more, and I want to get kids telling stories. You're and here. They have amazing stories to tell, and it's such a great experience for them, and it's public speaking, it's, you know, in learning how to tell a story. They're actually learning all about story structure and how stories work, which makes them better readers, and empowering yeah. it's very empowering and sometimes the kids who are not the great readers are the 
best storytellers. You know, they they can really grasp the what is makes a good story. And as soon as they can understand that and tell stories, then they can get a little bit more buy into what's on the page too. So as we begin to come to an end, uh, how do you go about crafting a story? Is it you have one particular approach? Do you write it out? Do you tell it to a mic into a microphone and record it? Which I, approach for does it vary? I very rarely will write a story down that it's going to be an oral telling. I, I usually draw them or I kind of story map them in segments. And um, for me, writing is a very different um, process. And um, the year before my dad died, I, I created a blog because I wanted he wanted me to write some stories. So I every week for a year, I wrote a story and, and had it up on this blog for my dad, really, because I was living in South Carolina. He could read them. But I found that to be so different to write a story versus to tell a story. So there's, you know, 60 plus stories I wrote for that blog for my dad that I had really yet to tell because somehow they changed on the page. But when I'm doing a story for um, performance or for telling, um, I often start with a picture like, oh, that family picture, because I have so many of my dad's pictures and I then um, piece together memories of it. And I check in with my siblings. Do you remember what was this part, you know? Um, and then I draw it, map it, um, and then tell it over and over again until I kind of weed out what's got to go, what's, what can keep. And um, so it's a lot of just retelling. And sometimes I have stories that I tell in different ways to, in the different settings or a different time. Or, so I have stories that sometimes blend together differently this piece goes with that piece. And sometimes they're, they're like puzzles that fit together differently in different times. <clears throat> Text and context. Mm -hmm. Well, my last question is always the same question for new or almost new storytellers. What briefly uh, tips would you share? Listen to stories, find out, you know, like listen, listen, listen to lots of stories um, and then start telling your own just at family, gatherings, get your family telling stories so you can hear their perspectives on the same things that you experienced, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a fun way to change the dialogue at the table, you know, um, and suggest in that casual conversations, find the stories and listen, and then go to things like True Tales Live and other kind of storytelling events to hear lots of tellers, because we all, everybody has different styles and different ways that they tell stories. Um, and and telling the personal narrative stories is one version of storytelling. Then there's people that tell traditional tales and those are wonderful to hear too. So just listen to lots of different storytellers, story types, and you'll you'll find your, your own little voice or big voice, whatever. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. Friends, this brings us to the end of our conversation with Martha Reed Johnson. Martha, again, thank you so much for plunging back into storytelling as our featured teller, very nice. And thanks for our backstory conversation. And friends, this brings us to the end of our program. Thanks again to our True Tales Live crew. And a reminder, as Amy explained, we are off for July and August. And our next show is September 27th at the usual time. It's an open theme. Be sure to log in. Our workshops do continue on Zoom through the summer. Our next one is next Tuesday, July 5th from 7 to 8.30. Perhaps your July 4th will generate a story in a good way. And if you're thinking about trying a story, whether generated from the 4th or any other way, our workshop is a great place to try out storytelling. Sign up on our website. Learn more about our program at truetaleslivenh.org. And while you're there, sign up for your, our newsletter edited by yours truly. And if you are already a subscriber, share the times with your friends who also might enjoy storytelling. Nigerian poet and novelist Ben Okri writes, a people are as healthy and confident as the stories they tell themselves. Sick storytellers can make nations sick. Without stories, we would go mad. Life would lose its moorings or orientation. Stories can conquer fear, you know. They can make the heart larger. That's our program for tonight. Thanks to our tellers and our crew and you. My name is David Frainer. Good night. Mm -hmm.